Well, good evening. This is Handlock Steve coming to you on the 24th of April. And exactly why did the 737 MAX crash? And that is going to be the topic this evening. And a warm welcome to all of you. It's great to see you here this evening. And uh, I sure hope you like this little story. Uh, this is by um, an airline engineer and pilot of 30 years experience writing about exactly what happened with the uh, 737 MAX and why it crashed. Now, you may wonder why I'm switching over to an engineering story instead of my usual uh, political narratives. But I think... Uh, well, firstly, it piqued my interest because there was two crashes uh, side by side and then I read a story of uh, a near crash that happened in another 737 MAX and uh, luckily on board there was a uh, pilot who was a passenger who knew how to disengage the MCAS system, which is the computer system that kind of takes over the flying of the plane, landing, takeoff, uh, in-flight. And, of course, it won't allow the pilot to interfere with it. Once it's engaged, you have to, it, it controls the plane. And apparently one of the pilots was madly reading through a manual as it's nose diving into the ground, uh, trying to figure out how to disengage this system. And uh, so I was attracted to it for that reason, that it is an explanation. And because I have a mechanical background, uh, I found it a very interesting read. But it's also a testimony to where I think we are and where we could be going in this uh, little old world of ours. Uh, because, you know, there is a head of engineering uh, in um, Purdue University down in the States there. And uh, her name is Donna Riley. And she thinks that rigor is racist. Here, take a look. Okay, here we go. A Washington Examiner. Engineering professor. Academic rigor enforces white male heterosexual privilege. And here she is, Donna Riley. Students who complain that their college courses are too difficult may have found a new friend in one Purdue engineering professor who's claiming that the concept of academic rigor merely exists to discipline students and enforce white privilege. Professor Donna Riley, the current head of the school's engineering education at Purdue University, is calling for schools to get rid of the current concept of academic rigor, complaining that it exists to accomplish dirty deeds in engineering education. In a recently published article titled Rigor Slash Us, Building Boundaries and Disciplining Diversity with Standards of Merit, Riley argues that despite serving as the aspirational quality academics apply to disciplinary standards of quality, Rigor has ultimately become too disciplinarian in nature to the extent that it selectively benefits white heterosexual males. Well, you can think that if you want. But I say, what a dope. Now, as you'll see in the story coming up from this engineer, that rigor is the one thing that was lacking. There was money involved in this story. Uh, it's actually an interesting, uh, the whole thing, because there was finances, uh, there was regulation, there was all kinds of things that were broken to allow this 737 MAX to get up in the air and pilots no extra training. And uh, But it, it's a testimony for what happens when you take rigor out of engineering and you start thinking that it is a racist or it is a social construct or something silly like that and uh, we're finding out the cost and we will continue to find out as long as we believe that rigor is not an important factor in engineering mathematics or in any kind of building that we do because these structures that we build these buildings we want them to stay up we want bridges to stay up we want our roads to last uh, we want our cars to stay together, we want them to be impact proof so if we have an accident we're going to survive the whole thing. And if you take rigor out of this whole thing, you are done like a dog's dinner I'm afraid. And uh, anyway, let's flip over to this story, I think you'll find it interesting as I did, and uh, then we'll come back and I'll do a quick wrap up. Okay, here we go. This is from uh, Mish Shedlock, uh, Mish Talk. Boeing 737 MAX unsafe to fly, new scathing report by pilot and software designer. Everything about the design and manufacture of the MAX was done to preserve the myth that it's just a 737. 
recertifying it as a new aircraft would have taken years and millions of dollars. In fact, the pilot licensed to fly the 737 in 1967 is still licensed to fly all subsequent versions of the 737. A pilot with 30 years of flying experience and 40 years of design experience rips decisions made by Boeing and the FAA. Gregory Travis, a software developer and pilot for 30 years, wrote a scathing report on the limitations of the 737 and the arrogance of software developers unfit to write aeroplane code. Travis provides easy to understand explanations including a test you can do by sticking your hand out of the window of a car to demonstrate stall speed. Design shortcuts meant to make a new plane seem like an old, familiar one are to blame. This was all about saving money. Boeing and the FAA pretended the 737 MAX is the same aircraft as the original 737 that flew in 1967 over 50 years ago. Travis was three years old at the time. Back then the 737 was a smallish aircraft with smallish engines and relatively simple systems. The new 737 is large and complicated. Boeing cut corners to save money. Cutting corners works until it fails spectacularly. Aerodynamics and software malpractice. Please consider how the Boeing 737 MAX disaster looks to a software developer. Emphasis is mine. The original 737 had, by today's standards, tiny little engines which easily cleared the ground beneath the wings. As the 737 grew and was fitted with bigger engines, the clearance between the engines and the ground started to get a little, um, tight. With the 737 MAX, the situation became critical. The engine on the original 737 had a fan diameter, that of the intake blades on the engine, of just 100 centimeters, 40 inches. Those planned for the 737 MAX have 176 centimeters. That's a center line difference of well over 30 centimeters a foot and you couldn't overlize the intake enough to hang the new engines beneath the wing without scraping the ground. The solution was to extend the engine up and well in front of the wing. However, doing so meant that the center line of the engine's thrust changed. Now, when the pilots applied power to the engine, the aircraft would have a significant propensity to pitch up or raise its nose. This propensity to pitch up with power application thereby increased the risk that the airplane could stall when the pilot punched it. Worse still, because the engine nacelles were so far in front of the wing and so large, the power increase will cause them to actually produce lift, particularly at high angles of attack, so the nacelles make a bad problem worse. I'll say it again. In the 737 MAX, the engine nacelles themselves can, at high angles of attack, work as a wing and produce lift. And the lift they produce is well ahead of the wing's center of lift, meaning the nacelles will cause the 737 MAX, at a high angle of attack, to go to a higher angle of attack. This is aerodynamic malpractice of the worst kind. It violated that most ancient of aviation canons and probably violated the certification criteria of the US Federal Aviation Administration. But instead of going back to the drawing board and getting the airframe hardware right, Boeing relied on something called the Manoe Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System, or MCAS. It all comes down to money, and in this case, MCAS was the way for both Boeing and its customers to keep the money flowing in the right direction. The necessity to insist that the 737 MAX was no different in flying characteristics, no different in systems from any other 737, was the key to the 737 MAX's fleet's fungibility. That's probably also the reason why documentation about the MCAS system was kept on the down low. Put in a change with too much visibility, particularly a change to the aircraft's operating handbook or to pilot training, and someone, probably a pilot, would have piped up and said, hey, this doesn't look like a 737 anymore. And then the money would flow in the wrong direction. When the flight computer trims the airplane to descend, because the MCAS system thinks it's about to stall, a set of motors and jacks push the pilot's control columns forward. It turns out that the elevator field computer can put a lot of force into that column. Indeed, so much force that a human pilot can quickly become exhausted trying to pull the column back and trying to tell the computer that this really, really should not be happening. The MCAS is implemented in the flight management computer, even at times when the autopilot is off, when pilots think they are flying the plane. 
In a fight between the flight management computer and human pilots over who is in charge, the computer will bite the humans until they give up and literally die. Finally, there's the need to keep the very existence of the MCAS system on the hush-hush lest someone say, hey, this isn't your father's 737 and bank accounts start to suffer. Those line codes were no doubt created by people at the direction of managers. In a pinch, a human pilot could just look out the windshield to confirm visually and directly that no, the aircraft is not pitched up dangerously. That's the ultimate check and should go directly to the pilot's ultimate sovereignty. Unfortunately, the current implementation of MCAS denies that sovereignty. It denies the pilots the ability to respond to what's before their own eyes. In the MCAS system, the flight management computer is blind to any other evidence that is wrong, including what the pilot sees with his own eyes and what he does when he desperately tries to pull back on the robotic control columns that are biting him and his passengers to death. The people who wrote the code for the original MCAS system were obviously terribly far out of their league and did not know it. How can they implement a software fix, much less give us any comfort that the rest of the flight management software is reliable? So Boeing produced a dynamically unstable airframe, the 737 MAX, that's big strike number one. Boeing then tried to mask the 737's dynamic instability with a software system, a big strike number two. Finally, the software relied on systems known for their propensity to fail, angle of attack indicators, and did not appear to include even rudimentary provisions to cross-check the outputs of the angle of attack sensor against other sensors, even the other angle of attack sensor. Big strike number three. None of the above should have passed muster. It is likely that MCAS, originally added in the spirit of increasing safety, has now killed more people than it could ever have saved. It does not need to be fixed with more complexity, more software. It needs to be removed altogether. Numerous bad decisions at every stage. Ultimately, 346 people are dead because of really bad decisions. Software engineer arrogance and Boeing's pretense that the 737 MAX is the same aircraft as 50 years ago. It is incredible that the plane has two sensors, but the system only uses one. A look out the window was enough to confirm the sensor was wrong. Boeing also offered cheap versions of the aircraft without some controls. The two crash flights were with the cheaper aircraft. An experienced pilot with adequate training could have disengaged MACS, but in one of the crash flights the pilot was desperately reading a manual trying to figure out how to do that. Flight stall test. If you stick your hand out the window of a car and your hand is level to the ground, you have a low angle of attack. There is no lift. Tilt your hand a bit and you have lift. Your arm will rise. When the angle of attack on the wing of an aircraft is too great, the aircraft enters aerodynamic stall. The same thing happens with your hand out a car window. At a steep enough angle, your arm wants to flop down on the car door. The MCAS software overrides what a pilot can see by looking out the window. Useless manuals. If you need a manual to stop a plane from crashing mid-flight, the manual is useless, it's already too late. The pilot has seconds in which to react, yet instead of requiring additional training and alerting pilots to the dangers, Boeing put this stuff in a manual. This was necessary as part of the pretense that a 737 is a 737 is a 737. Yes, foolishness indeed. So anyway, I think at the very least, Boeing is in an awful lot of trouble. Uh, this could even bankrupt them to think that you've killed this many people by obviously overlooking uh, regulations and bypassing and so on and so forth. I can just see the lawsuits now. It'll be in the billions of dollars. And uh, so this is the cost of removing rigor. And I think we're going to find the same in medicine. Uh, you know, we're getting into this whole issue of gender. Okay? And uh, now, when I was growing up, when I was a young boy, in fact, most of the science, most of the study in medicine was around men. And women were considered to be uh, just smaller versions of men. And children were also thought to be little adults.
And of course now we have branches of medicine that cover all of these men, women and uh, children because we've realized that each human body male, female, and child, male and female, have completely different part, obviously different parts of them, but inside the endocrine system is completely different, the reproductive system is completely different. Um, it, it, you know, I mean, to deny science and to say that that is a social construct is an incredibly dangerous step to take for the health of individuals, especially women. And that medicine would take an incredible turn for the worse to ignore that fact. And this must be built into every area of study, every aspect of life. You know, if you want to go and study the ocean bed, you want a diving bell that will withstand great pressure. That takes rigor. And what that means is getting rid of the idiot student. You can't be forgiving somebody rigor and say it's a racist term to hold uh, white supremacy in place and male privilege in place when you have a diving bell that leaks at 2,000 feet and four people are going to die inside of it. You want fireworks that don't explode in your hand. Uh, you want um, uh, devices in the kitchen that don't cut people's fingers off. That takes rigor. And you don't get rigor by forgiving stupidity and maybe those are stark terms but that's the truth of the matter and as far as I'm concerned when I have a surgeon operating on my body I want the best surgeon I want the surgeon who knows what they're doing who has rigor uh, built into their system and is going to do the absolute best job and I am not going to allow uh, race color creed or sexual orientation to enter into that it will be the best person, period. And I will ignore uh, any of those other uh, items. Okay, and, uh, and this is how we have to go through life. You have to, there are certain things in life that you have to ignore all of those social issues and depend on the science. When you fire a rocket into space, you don't want a seal to break. Uh, like the Space Shuttle Challenger in 86. You know, I'm sure those people were none too happy at the lack of rigor on that one particular seal. So I think that we need to be paying attention to things like this in engineering universities and it must be a priority in any student's mind who wants to be a successful engineer. Okay, if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe and comment below. Uh, we love it when you're part of the narrative and I want to thank you so much for all of my viewers, uh, all of my subscribers, uh, the numbers are going up, we're heading towards 21,000 subscribers and uh, it shows a level of interest which has been um, surprising and extremely enjoyable to myself. So thank you so very much from the bottom of my heart for subscribing to my channel and um, listening to the conversation. So in the meantime, this is Hound Dog Steve signing off, wishing you a wonderful evening and we will talk to you very, very shortly. You take care now. See ya. Bye.